Welcome, everyone. Um, very excited that you're here. We have about 30 minutes together uh, this morning for me and Alex, uh, maybe a different time zone for you. And we want to use the time to give you a very quick overview of the class that we teach starting in October called Technical Foundations for Product Managers. Before we jump in, um, we'd love to introduce ourselves. Um, I can start. My name is Anand. Um, it's very nice to meet everybody here. Um, I've spent the past more years than I would care to share publicly uh, working in product leadership roles across a number of different companies. I'm currently the SVP of product at a company called Rula that helps people find therapists who take their insurance. Um, before this, I was a VP of product at a startup called Pilot, it's backed by Sequoia and Index and Stripe. Before that, I was a director of product at Gusto. Um, before that, I was a product lead at Dropbox, which is actually where Alex and I first met many years ago. Before that, I was a director of product at Zynga, running the Wars with Friends um, and other uh, with Friends game studios. Before that, I did my undergrad and my master's at Stanford. Um, I also teach product management at Stanford in the Graduate School of Engineering, um, as well as obviously through Reforge. Alex, you want to share a little bit about who you are? Absolutely. Everyone, my name is Alex. I am most recently the CTO and one of the co-founders of an organization called U.S. Digital Response. Uh, we help governments with their technology challenges. There's a lot of bridging the gap between folks who are not very technical by nature and technologists, which is part of what makes me excited about this class. Um, we, um, I also more recently, oh, sorry, <laughs> distracted by that chat message. Um, we, uh, I, uh, prior to USDR was a director of engineering at Dropbox. That's where I met Anand, where we worked on Dropbox business together. Uh, I also have a few little side projects that are dedicated to teaching. One of them is a website, cprogramming.com that has been, uh, teaching over a hundred million people had a program in a uh, language called C and C++ for the last 20 some odd years. And I run a, a podcast called Decoding Sales where I bridge the sales and engineering worlds again. Uh, you might see a little theme here. And then finally, um, from Harvard, uh, where I was also a teaching fellow uh, for several of the introductory computer science classes. So very excited to have you all here and possibly in the class. Love to connect the dots between the engineering world, the technology world, and kind of the, the business needs, uh, which is part of what makes this a really fun class to talk about. Perfect. Um, and as Anand referenced earlier, we were a PM tech lead pair at Dropbox. So we've actually lived the life uh, that many of you <laughs> are experiencing uh, with a, you know, going through this process of working with an engineering partner. Uh, one thing Anand didn't mention, he doesn't actually have a CS degree. So he, like you, did not come in with a deep uh, computer science technical background. And so we've also lived that journey of bridging that gap and that a lot of those lessons that we took from working together at Dropbox have been distilled down into this class. Uh, and we're really excited to share them so that other people have an easier journey uh, than we did, although we got along really great. Um, this is a chance to distill those lessons and help the next, uh, next group of folks along. Perfect. So let's talk about what problem we're solving with this class. Why does this course exist? Um, I'm guessing that uh, at some point in your career, if you're interested in this webinar, uh, you have gone through the process of trying to figure out uh, how technical you need to be. Uh, maybe you took a SQL class somewhere, or maybe you went on the internet and you tried to learn basic programming, or maybe you spent time with an engineering manager or a technical lead in your organization to learn a little bit about your architecture. Why is it so hard to get good advice on this topic? If you type how technical do product managers need to be into Google, you get on the order of 100 million results back. And the top two are directly contradictory. First one says you really don't need a technical background at all. And the second one says you absolutely need a technical background as a mandatory prerequisite. It's really hard to get good advice on this topic. You go and you look and you ask smart people or talented people. Everyone has some personal perspective about what worked for them. And they're not really trying to distill it into generalized lessons that will work for you. Why is it hard to answer this question? Is it just because people like making stuff up on the internet? No, it actually turns out that the answer to this question is hard because the answer is very different depending on the person. It depends on things like your industry. So if you're working as an AI product manager versus a SaaS product manager, you probably need very different levels of technical sophistication. AI being closer to the cutting edge of frontier research means you probably need to be more technical than if you work at a SaaS app. It's also specific to your company. So if you work at a 100,000 person company versus a five person startup, you're gonna get different answers to this question. It's different if you're working on hardware versus software. It's different depending on your role. So if you're working on a very narrow field like 
a billing product manager or a risk and fraud product manager probably need a lot of technical expertise. If you're doing a platform PM or something more on the engineering side, again, more technical expertise required. And finally, it's also specific to you. Um, you might have taken one CS class in college somewhere. You might know a little bit of SQL. You might be able to read an architecture diagram. So the reason this question is so hard to fundamentally answer and the reason that a lot of the resources that Alex and I looked at when we were trying to develop this class fundamentally failed to answer this question effectively is because the answer is totally customized to your individual situation. The good news is Alex and I are here to help. So one of the things we spent time doing as we were putting this course together is distilling a framework that you can run that will clearly answer how technical you need to be as a product manager. And what's interesting about this is it's totally personalized to you. So we'll run you through things like your company size and your role and your stage and what you know and what you don't know and run you through that flowchart. And what we'll produce is something called the technical roadmap, which is your personalized learning plan that helps you learn what you need to know to be the best version of a product manager. A little bit about how the class itself is structured. So it's a three-part lecture series with one bonus module on AI. In class one, we talk about how to build this technical knowledge roadmap that we just identified. We walk you through what your engineering counterparts look like, and we give you this framework that at the end produces a specialized list of learning topics that you can go deep on. The second class is organized around foundational engineering concepts we think that everybody should know. These are things like what are APIs, how do they work, what is the front end, what is the back end, how do networks work, basics of the internet, very large high level conceptual concepts that you might need to know as a product manager, no matter what you're working on. In addition to class two, going deep on some of the foundational engineering concepts, Alex and I have also written a roughly 75 page uh, custom library of technical materials that answer a bunch of specific questions. If you wanna know what SOC 2 is or GDPR or how front end works or a little bit about C or how an LLM works, there's a whole technical library that's included as part of this course that you can download and save for your reference if you ever have questions about a particular topic. Finally, in class three, we talk about how to actually apply your technical knowledge for the best results. Uh, it's that not sufficient to actually have the knowledge. Sometimes the knowledge can even backfire from a results perspective. We walk you through how to use some of the newfound technical knowledge you have in order to get the best results and the best career acceleration as a product manager. I mentioned this at the beginning, but we also have a special bonus module this time around on AI. We've heard a lot of interest in prior classes um, where people want to know more about LLMs and the cutting edge frontier models. Alex will talk more about this in a couple of minutes, but we do a special 45 minute Q&A office hour session where you go very deep on LLMs and what you need to know as a product manager and how you can use them in product development. A little bit about who the class is for. So it's primarily oriented towards product managers. What I mean by that is someone who either is doing the PM job today or someone who thinks they'll be doing the PM job in the near future. It's targeted people who are relatively early in their career, roughly five years of experience or less is probably the sweet spot, a little bit higher, not the end of the world, but if you're a VP of product running an organization of 40 people, this is probably not the class for you. Like Alex mentioned, it's focused on people with non-technical backgrounds. So if you were converted to product from something like a support role or a sales role or a success role, if we came through an MBA background, this will be perfect. And we assume no amount of foundational knowledge will start everything from the ground up. Um, and then finally, we really want this class to be the theory while you're able to do the, the actual practice uh, in your real job and real life. It's ideal if you actually have a project that you're working on, either as uh, at a company where you're employed or a side project, so you can put some of the lessons into practice on a week to week basis. Um, but we won't uh, assume you have any foundational knowledge as you go in. And again, about the teaching principles, we really want this to be useful for you. Like Alex mentioned, we have some lived experience working through this problem together. Our goal is to give you real world cases from places we've worked, like Dropbox and Gusto and other companies that um, have done this really successfully. And the thesis here is that the class will provide the structure and the learning material, while either your job or the project you're working on actually provides the experience and helps you fill it up. Alex, you want to talk a little bit about our special topic? Absolutely, yeah. So as Anand mentioned earlier, uh, we're really excited to add this new uh, section on artificial intelligence. It needs no introduction that AI is a hot topic right now, but uh, the challenge with AI is knowing what do you need to know and what don't you need to know as a product manager, right? If you think about a large language model, you could know anything from how you interact with it as a user to what are the matrix multiplies doing at massive scale on GPUs to compute 
uh, calculations and make decisions. And so what we've actually done for this uh, topic is really distilled down what we think is going to be most useful for you as a, as a PM working on software that wants to integrate or use an AI module. We're not targeting you if you're going to be a machine learning researcher, but we want you to be able to interface with the teams in your organization that are doing the deep, you know, you know the, the people who are kind of in the math world, in the, the GPU world, and trying to turn that into something that can be used from a product perspective. So we talk about how do LLMs actually work at a level that's targeted for a PM to understand it'll be useful in the job. How are they trained? How are they evaluated? This is actually a really important part of understanding how to make the most of a large language model in production. Um, and then talk about how to integrate them into feature development. And then also how to improve the performance of models. What do you need to know as a PM? Let's say that you've built this amazing feature. It's not doing what you want quite yet. How do you get it over the finish line? What are the tools and techniques that are state of the art right now? So this is really designed to help you as somebody who wants to use AI to make the most uh, the most of these new technologies in business context without getting into so many details that you'll be lost and confused and wishing that you had taken four more math classes. So uh, lastly, we thought it'd be really helpful for you all just to see a few words about what other people have said about the class. It's a little bit embarrassing and awkward to read nice things about us. So I'm going to just give you all a minute to read the slides here, but these are direct quotes from students who've taken uh, the class over the last uh, few sessions. Cool. Um, we'll leave this up on the screen for a minute, um, but the remaining time we have today, which is about 15-ish uh, minutes, is mostly for Q&A, either on the class or any materials that it covers or doesn't cover. Um, so Alex has the Q&A window up in front of him and is looking through all of the questions that people are upvoting. Um, Alex, do you want to kick us off with uh, one of the Q&A questions that we can answer together? Absolutely. I want to, uh, first of all, just encourage folks, uh, I saw a number of folks going in chat, introducing themselves. Please also ask questions in the Q&A. We've got one right now um, from Elise. Uh, this one is, uh, are there any cases or exercises we'll work through in the live sessions, or is it primarily lecture style where we listen for the full time and make notes and absorb? Great question. It's primarily the second, um, although it's a little bit of a mix. I'd say it's probably 80% lecture and 20% cases. Um, what we found when we did this the first few times is if we ask people to do all of the materials async and focus only on cases in the class, people were lost. They tended to not do the homework. So we are probably 80%. We'll walk you through it live and 20% cases. There certainly are cases. Again, Alex and I include real cases from things that we've worked through or people on our team have worked through. But it's probably 80% lecture, 20% case review. Fantastic. Um, there's also another question in here um, that's not directed at us. Um, uh, Paul, I think this is for you. How do you en enroll in the course per se? Yes, I can jump in here. So you can actually click on the link that Alex and Anand have shared here uh, to directly enroll in the course that they've been talking about. Yep. Uh, so Pretty we'll easy. send this. We'll send the slides out after. It'll include this link, and Paul will include materials for enrolling. Um, you can also go to Reforge directly and search for the Technical Foundations for Product Managers class. Um, the class is four lectures in October, uh, so Tuesday morning specific time, the 8th, the 15th, and the 22nd at 8.30 a.m., and we have that special AI session on Wednesday, October 5th, 16th in the morning as well. Uh, but enrollments all the way are open all the way up until basically the first day of class, so as long as you get there before 8.29 on October 8th, you're good to go. Oh, and I actually see another question here about, do you need to have a Reforge subscription? You do need to be a member um, of Reforge in order to access our courses. Um, one of the things Paolo didn't mention, there's kind of two ways you can access the class. You can enroll in the live session and you can also read through the materials as well, um, which is an async version of class. If you have trouble making these times or something else, all the lectures are recorded. Um, so if you're in a different time zone, it's difficult for you to make it or you're traveling. We record every lecture and we also release those to people who are enrolled in the class as well. Um, but if you, the class is hard for some reason, you can also look through some of the content asynchronously. There's way more content in the live class that we don't have in the async material. You can kind of think of that as the very light version of the class. Alex? All right. Oh, another question uh, came in. How useful would this course be for someone who has practical experience with software testing and development? 
My intuition is that it would still be very helpful. Um, although Alex, you might be in a better position to answer this. Um, I assume I'm, I'm making reading between the lines a bit. If someone came from a QA background or like a software validation background, there's certainly things that you're going to know from a technical perspective that the average person with a non-technical background won't, but you probably won't know things about architecture diagrams, maybe API development, the basic three tier SaaS architecture, or some of the other core components. So my intuition without knowing the specifics of what you've learned in QA side of the house, that is probably still helpful. We also cover a lot about communication. Um, we talk a lot about how to get the most out of your engineering partners. We cover concepts like how to do better estimation, how to improve engineering velocity, how to think about managing tech debt. So those are also probably things that don't really get covered on the QA side. Alex, anything you want to add that I missed? I think that's right. I think uh, somebody who has a QA experience um, or software development experience will probably get a little bit less out of uh, the second class, uh, just by the nature of the material being designed to be a foundational set of concepts. Uh, that being said, we do look at that material from the perspective of what a product manager needs to know. And I do think that may give a, a slightly different lens on the material than you might normally get if you were sort of building uh, bottom up as a, a, an engineer would. And so I think you may get some things from it, uh, although it probably won't be as helpful. Uh, I do think that the topics related to AI and the uh, technical knowledge library may also be quite useful. Even though it's, again, covering technical concepts, it's coming from the perspective of what does a PM uh, need to know? And some of that material is going to be uh, somewhat distinctive from what a, an engineer might be focusing on. Um, oh, there's a good question here um, about whether, well, lots of questions coming in. Okay, let's see here. Um, somebody's asking if they can, uh, how it works if they cannot attend the live classes, can they uh, purchase just the recorded lectures? Um, and is it the same cost? Uh, you can. Um, so the way it would work is you enroll as normal in the class. We record all the lectures. We send them out to people who are enrolled in the class. You can watch them asynchronously. Um, there's also a Slack channel that comes specifically with the class, which is 24 seven. So you can ask Alex and I questions. You can talk to your classmates. Um, and I believe it is the same cost, uh, if you can't make them because, uh, we record them and send them out. Okay. That's correct. Same cost. Uh, another another great question here. What are the best foundational skills, for example, SQL or applications, for example, Figma, uh, that we should read up on before joining this course and any A apps, AI apps specifically? It's a great question. Um, love the enthusiasm of being willing to do homework before the course actually starts. Um, my suggestion is that you don't have to go do a bunch of required reading in advance of the course. What I find to be more useful is to actually come with good knowledge around which specific questions you want answered. So know, for example, which topics matter and don't matter to your job. Um, if you are in a PM at a company that doesn't do a lot of SQL, that may be a totally useless skill. So we can help fill in the gaps on the technical knowledge side and on the prereq side. What's most helpful for you if you want to prep for day one is to know where your gaps are, know which skills are the ones that you want to close. And then we can either use the materials or office hours, which Alex and I also run separately to help you close that gap as quickly as possible. But again, there's no expectation that you've spent 20 hours preparing for the class where we want to meet everybody where they are. And we're assuming no foundational knowledge, knowing which questions you want to ask is probably the most important prereq. All right. A couple more questions here. Um, first, uh, does this course answer the question, how to become a product manager? Doesn't. Um, so uh, I have a separate course with Reforge um, called Product Management Foundations that uh, I teach with uh, another partner named Joanna Zhang, who's the uh, uh, chief product officer at Linktree. That one is closest. Um, so that one assumes that you are either a brand new product manager or you're someone who's about to be a product manager. And I believe there's a bonus in there that's a little bit about interviewing and career manager or career management and career ladders. So if you're thinking, if you're looking for content on how to become a product manager, I would not suggest this class. I would suggest the product management foundations class over technical foundations. All right. Another one. Would you recommend the course to someone who is currently in sales, business development, and considering a transition to a product focused role? Yes, I think you're in the sweet spot. Uh, so again, the sweet spot is non-technical background, either about to become a PM or currently a PM. The only, the reason I hesitated for a minute is part of it's dependent on how much you, like the probability you think you will get the job. 
So what we don't cover in this class is interview prep or again, how to get the product management job. But if you feel like you're on the cusp or you're six months away from getting it, if you take this class, you will be able to hit the ground running more than if you didn't. So again, it's, this isn't a class to help you transition into PM, but if you feel like that piece is well buttoned up or you want some more foundational technical knowledge to help you pass your interviews, this would be a great course for you. All right, and another one. Can you share how relevant the course might be for someone in state or local government in the US where there aren't clear product manager roles, but clearly a need for product managers, I agree with this, uh, to bridge contractors or engineering teams and program managers, or is it more focused on the private sector? Alex, with a, a number of years of working with government experience, you wanna take this one? Uh, uh, sure, happy to. I think that this course is relevant for someone in uh, those kind of roles. Uh, I We cover a lot of material that is broadly going to be relevant, both from the technical foundational concepts, as well as uh, some of the uh, approach to what not, what technical knowledge is going to be important. I do think one place where it's going to be a little bit different, we cover some material on uh, working with what we call your bridge partner, somebody who's the engineering counterpart on the other side. And in a role where you might have a less fluid interface to your bridge partners, that may be less relevant. Also, I will say all of our examples are going to be from the uh, private sector. Uh, we don't have any public sector specific examples, but a lot of the concepts I think translate really well. Um, one of the things that I, I was, I'm really excited about is that, um, you know, folks in government um, kind of bridging the product engineering gap, I think can be can be really helpful. So again, I think it's helpful. I think some of the material will need to uh, be kind of, you'll need to do a little minimal translation from a, a private sector to a public sector context, but uh, the actual concepts will be, uh, will be valuable. Yeah, one extension to that, I would also recommend the product management foundations class I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, my partner, for example, works in government, um, and they don't have the same titles, but a lot of the work is the same. You can be a program manager or a project manager or a producer, and it just depends. And a lot of the skills fundamentally about defining requirements, figuring out what problem you need to solve, the best way to solve the problem, project managing it to completion are all very similar to the basics of being a good product manager. Um, so like Alex mentioned, you'll certainly get value out of this class as well. The other class I would take a look at is product management fundamentals, which I think has great applicability to kind of the program manager equivalent in the public sector. Yeah, uh, another question here. Um, what about marketing folks who are in a technical org for the first time and looking to speak the rest of the, sorry, to speak the language of the rest of the org? Is this class for them? Yes, on the language speaking, but it is not specifically targeted at marketing content. So things that we don't cover in depth here are things like, a CMS or some of the other things that you might uh, look that you might see in a normal MarTech stack. Um, we don't cover things like lifecycle emails or outbound tools or things like that. So it won't give you detailed knowledge on the technical implementation of a traditional MarTech stack. It's more focused on the product side of the house. But if you want to speak the same language so that when you go talk to an engineer about why a query is slow or why you can't get a user ID before you, a, a person signs up for your product, all of that stuff will bridge very nicely. All right. And another one. We've got a lot of good questions here. Do you feel that AI knowledge is now non-negotiable for early PMs, or is this more of a specific module to address being a PM in emerging industries versus prevalent industries? This is a tough question to answer. I think a lot of this depends on the philosophy of your company and what your company does. I will say that my like personal take on LLMs is Overnight, a bunch of things that were historically very hard problems for computers to solve became very easy for computers to solve. That opened up brand new worlds of things like text-to-speech, speech-to-text, image recognition, unstructured to structured data transformation that was previously just very hard to do well. So I think it would be wise for nearly any product manager to be looking at the capabilities of an LLM and saying, what are the things I can do with software now that I just couldn't do with software pre-2018? and figuring out if that's useful to you. The answer to that question will spit out very different things. Depend If you're working on a podcast translation company and you're not using AI, you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, but if you're working on something, uh, if you're working in the defense industry for something that operates a bunch with classified information, probably less of a cutting edge tool for you. So the answer to the question will depend on your company and your product and a bunch of other things. 
but I think it is wise for every person to run through the mental checklist of the things that were previously hard that are now easy and seeing if any of those might apply in interesting ways to your product. And Ag, maybe I'll just add a little bit to that. I think that similar to the way that the internet in the early 2000s, late 1990s, became a thing that at first applied to some businesses and now applies to literally everyone in the way that mobile in the you know late 2000s, early 2010s became a major, major focus of basically every business at Dropbox. We had a one point where we were very mobile first in a lot of our development, for example, even though we were at core a desktop product. Uh, my suspicion is that AI is going to start to take on a pretty similar role where not necessarily today in all businesses, but the capabilities it unlocks and the translation of a new set of things that computers can do that they couldn't do before is going to be pretty fundamental. And I think it would be a mistake to uh, assume that it's a flash in the pan. That doesn't mean that t literally today, every PM needs to go and become an AI expert and apply AI in your product. You should only do that if it makes sense. And that's a really important part of the course is talking about when it makes sense and when it doesn't. Uh, but I think that over the course of the next few years, it would be very smart to get up to speed on what's possible and stay at the cutting edge, if at all possible. 100%. Um, we have about one minute left, Alex, maybe one more question. And then, uh, Paolo, do you want to wrap us up? All right. Well, one more question. Uh, Anand, one, um, well, okay, well, this person's asking, do you still think it's state of the art to learn Python? Depends what problem you're solving. So I'll give you my like soapbox on this for a second. I actually think that most PMs don't really need to know how to code. Um, I happen to have taught myself how to code um, and it has come in useful at times, but I don't think it's prerequisite for being a great product manager. That said, if you were going to choose one language to learn that isn't SQL, um, that isn't about data extraction, my personal suggestion would be to pick Python over something else, Ross, Java, whatever. There are lots of reasons that are way beyond the scope of the next 15 seconds for why I think that. But the short summary is I think it does the best job of hiding all of the frustrating parts of computer science while exposing all of the good ones, which give you the right mental models you need to reason about what is easy and what is hard from a software perspective, instead of mucking with syntax and a bunch of other, and memory allocation, a bunch of other things that you just don't spend a bunch of time on. So short answer, I think that most PMs don't need to learn how to program. we we'll talk about that in the class. But if you're going to learn how to program, my personal suggestion would be Python. It's also the most popular language in the world right now. Yeah. And it's also the language, it was sort of on an uptick as well, because a ton of the AI stuff is written in Python. Cool. Um, we are at time for today. Um, Paolo, you want to wrap us up?